Now tonight I want to lay some groundwork for the rest of our series together, looking at some of the, the beginnings of worship. I invite your attention to John's Gospel, chapter 4. For it is in this chapter that we find more teaching on worship than any other place in the New Testament. That's bothersome to some because, again, it seems the Lord is teaching the wrong person. He's not teaching his disciples or the apostles. He's teaching a woman. And she's even the wrong kind of woman. Will the day ever come when we stop judging after the flesh and allow the Holy Spirit to judge according to the Spirit? Now, you've been standing for some length of time. I shall not insist that you stand again. But I want to read through the 19th verse so that we have the whole as background for that we would share with you. When, therefore, the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not just his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. And then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, set thus on the well, it was about the sixth hour, that would be noon. Then there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. May I just pause? I wonder if these disciples ever did anything right. Jesus is thirsty, so they go in the city to buy some salt herring. <laughs> Do you know why? They were hungry. Don't we always give to the Lord what we want? Verse 9, Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou wast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, Ooh, uh, er, mm, uh, well, um, uh, that's a little difficult to, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> you see, I don't have a husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he with whom thou art now shacked up is not thy husband. <laughs> eh, loose translation. <laughs> In that saidest thou truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. It causes me to believe, brethren, that if we really want to be known as a prophet, we need but dig up the dirt on people's marriages, right? Uh, may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. What a woman to talk to worship about. And yet there has to be a reason. Jesus does nothing without reason, without purpose. I want you to sense with me that the first step in worship is confrontation. You do not confront him, he confronts you. As we'll read tomorrow night in verse 23, the Father is out seeking the worshipers. Worshipers are not seeking the Father. So rare are they that the Father is seeking worshipers. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Spirit seeks to make us be conformed to the image of God's dear Son, but the Father is seeking worshipers. And the first step in his procuring a worshiper is to confront him with his own presence. 
But God has learned that man has great difficulty accepting his presence. When he showed himself as fire, men fled. When he showed himself as darkness, men hid their face. When he shook the earth, men groaned in their spirit. When he spoke to the prophets, they stoned them. So he sent himself in the form of human flesh, and as our dear brother from England so masterfully portrayed it, it's the only part of humanity that God borrowed, but he did become man, in order that we might be able to relate to him in a less fearful manner than in the relationship God had extended consistent with his character. I'm convinced that worshipers are conscripts, not volunteers. The Lord chooses his worshipers, and divine confrontation perpetrates a crisis from which we will either be better or bitter, but we're going to be miserable while we make up our mind. Remember, Jesus told his disciples in John 15, 16, you haven't chosen me. I've chosen you. I've ordained you. Now, I don't want to get far on this digression, but I'm glad to see more and more people accepting the fact that really we don't have much choice beyond accepting his choice. He hath chosen us in him from the foundations of the earth. And there came a day when we recognized his choice and acquiesced to it and submitted to it, and that was the beginning of a fresh new walk in God. The choices of God, and I believe that he is making the choice for us to be worshipers of the Father. Now, the way we find that he has chosen us to be a worshiper is that he waits at some busy spot in our life and just shows up and confronts us. Oh, I don't mean in a religious circumstance. That never bothers us. As long as he shows up with the robed choir, we can handle it. But it's when he shows up on the job, or while you're driving the car, or in the schoolroom, or while you're just quietly meditating upon a TV program. <laughs> and lo and behold, there is the Son of God. Whew. But it's a prelude. We see, worship and religion don't necessarily coincide. Matter of fact, God and religion don't get along very well. Religion, for the most part, is a substitute for God. But it's all done in his name, of course. Never has his signature, just his name. But this confrontation, this showing up in a non-scheduled appearance, this confrontation is the first step in producing worshipers. And usually he'll seek to involve you in doing something for him. Something very simple, never anything big. We never have any trouble when the Lord asks us to do something big. We always say no. <laughs> but we do have some difficulty when it's something small enough that we could say yes to. For instance, were the Lord to confront you right now and say, I want you to go to Kenya, Africa for the next nine years and give yourself for the missions of Elam there. You could give God lots of reasons, like a mortgage on the house, a mortgage on the car, a mortgage on the kids, a mortgage on, and you know. Lord, when we're paid out of debt, uh, we're, we're looking forward to 1993, then maybe we could. But what if instead of asking the big thing, as you're reaching for a one, he suggests a five, that's when you get into problems because you really could give a five. It would not bankrupt you. It's just some little thing the Lord asks. And I don't think he's as interested in the extra four as he's interested in your reaction. He's just watching to see what you'll do about something little before he starts involving you in something big. He's not going to bring you before the presence of the Father to find out if you obediently worship until he has checked you out on a little thing like giving him a glass of water without a fight. Right? Don't we train our children on little issues if we wait until they're big it's too much of a crisis to teach from the child drops a piece of paper and we say honey pick up that paper and the child says I don't want to now the issue of picking up the paper really isn't all that big 
But this is a marvelous training experience, and you're going to go to the fullest extent of training to make that child pick up the paper. It would be a thousand times easier to walk up and pick up the paper yourself. But the issue is disobedience. And if you can teach that child obedience on the issue of the paper, which is so small it hardly matters, you'll have no great problems with disobedience on issues that do. So I find the Lord does most of his training, at least in my life, on small things. Things that have, as far as I can see, no eternal value whatsoever. Things that it wouldn't matter which way they went. It's going to come out all right anyway. But the issue is to find the obedience level of my heart. Will I do what he says on things small? Confrontation. And there are two responses to confrontation. We'll only have time to deal with one tonight. The other tomorrow night. And for some of you who, because of work, must leave the session, please remember we'll be on the air and you can get the rest of this message tomorrow evening by radio. It has advantages being on radio. When you get to the part you don't like, you can turn it down for a while. <laughs> the problem there is you don't know what part you're going to like, so you keep turning it up at the wrong moments. But the very first response to confrontation is conflict. Tremendous conflict. Oh, you say, oh, no, just a minute, Brother Corn. Oh, no, no. If the Lord were to appear to me, that would be the most glorious experience of my life. Oh, I would love it. Would you? I dare believe if we had a strong manifestation of God's confrontation right here and now, we would have at least three new exits out of this building instantly. <laughs> I enjoyed a brother from England in the early part of the service. I enjoyed my month of April in that country. But I ministered in one of the churches in England, thought I was keeping it rather shallow and simple, but somewhere along the line, the presence of the Lord showed up. The building was virtually full, and within less than three minutes, there were 15 people left. I never saw a building empty so fast. It was actually dangerous. Pastor grabbed one mic, I grabbed the other and asked for them to, to be more cautious, be careful, slow down. It was as though somebody had screamed fire. They couldn't handle it. For the first reaction to confrontation is conflict. You see, Christ cuts right across the grain of our life. And his very presence is threatening. I've often likened it to a giant magnifying mirror that reflects every pimple and blackhead on our face. Who needs it? And there at the well of your life, he sits. And without ever saying a word, he reflects the worst of you. His very attitude silently condemns our attitude. Have you ever had a real good pity party going and the Lord show up? He doesn't have to say a thing. Just his being there blows the whole party. And his purity only amplifies our impurity. Never do I feel more filthy than when standing close to him. And as was pointed out to us early in the service, so it was with Isaiah. And perhaps Thursday we'll be able to show that to you in more depth. But when we see ourselves in contrast with the church, we look pretty good. When we see ourselves in contrast with the world, we're Mr. Pure and Mr. Clean. When we see ourselves in contrast to the Lord Jesus Christ, woe is me. And it's threatening to see yourself in a bad light at any time. None of us like to be contrasted with a person who is greatly superior to us. My favorite form of exercise is swimming, and I generally carry swimming trumps with me in all of my travels. But will you believe, I think you'll find it easy to believe, that I went five months last year and never went in one pool, although I was in many motels that had lovely pools and in countries where it was warm enough. Do you know why I didn't swim? Every time I had the time to swim and get in my trunks, I'd peek out and there were some of those Mr. Muscle Men out there, beautifully built. They were the dimensions in the chest I am on the waistline. <laughs> and I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Later, I did a few uh, midnight swims, 
Then I decided it was time to go on a diet, and I've knocked myself down one and a half suit sizes and still a ways to go, but you know what I'm talking about. How many of you ladies would be really comfortable at a banquet hosted by Miss America? Now, the, the contrast always leaves us a little less than, and when the Lord just shows up in your life, you see yourself at your worst, and none of us like that. James says that we, for the most part, look in a mirror, see our true self, and walk away deliberately forgetting what we saw. But you can't walk away from him. No matter which way you turn, there he is. And the conflict begins. Now, note the progression of the conflict in this one. Verse 7, Jesus merely asked for a drink of water, a very common request. A request, I understand, is never denied in the eastern countries that are short of water. Perhaps we'll have to start in Southern California. They're going to be that way before long. Even if it's your enemy, you gave them a drink. Would that help you understand why during the battle when Caesarea fled and went in a woman's tent and asked for something to drink, she gave him a drink first and then drove the nail through his temples? Sure. Always give your enemy a drink and then kill him. This little woman, as she approached the well, with her background, having to come at noon, which was not the normal time to draw water, she couldn't draw water when the other women were because they had already ostracized her and driven her away because of her low moral standard. Coming at noon when the women would be busy with the household, the men would be busy in the field, the travelers likely resting under a shade tree, was less than excited to see a man seated at the pool. With all she had been through with men, I'm not sure she was at all interested in seeing another man. And worst of all, this was a Jew, one of those holy Joes, you know. And I've always felt that as she approached the well, she kind of turned her back to him and came toward the well with her back to Jesus, tied the rope on the jug and let it down into the well. And it was a deep well, 70 feet deep. And as she pulled the rope to bring the jug back up, the part of the rope that had gone down into the water began to splash water. And as the jug came out of the opening of the well and she was untying it, water was just joshing off. And you know what it's like to be thirsty and see water? That's one reason I so rarely drink in the pulpit, because everybody gets thirsty. Just they no longer listen to the sermon. But when you're really thirsty, and I have enough people tune me out as it is, just the sight of water really inflames the desire. And so Jesus just simply stated to the back of her neck, May I please have a drink of water? Normal request. She had likely drawn water for countless strangers, had probably drawn water for a lot of the women in the town, had drawn water for animals. You would think that she could simply turn around and give him a drink, but instead she gave him an argument. She wanted a total racial adjustment, verse 9. When you Jews give us Samaritans our rights, when you treat us as we should be treated, then I'll give you a drink of water. Hey, what does race equality have to do with giving Jesus a drink of water? Nothing. But then the arguments we give him really don't have much to do with the issue either. He asks for some simple thing and we drag up another issue that has nothing to do with his communication and throw it in his face and say, when you settle that, I'll do this. The Lord just ignored her. And in verse 10, he offered her living water. And verses 11 and 12, she offered him an argument. <laughs> You're going to give me living water. You can't even get yourself a drink. Who do you think you are? How are you going to get water? If you can't get water out of the 70 foot well, where are you going to get artesian water? Where are you? Who do you think you are? Greater than the man that dug this well for us and his children, his cattle. Oh boy, look at you. Have you ever told the Lord he can't do what he said he could do? Oh, 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 yeah, sure, God, I know, I know, I know. In verse 14, Jesus wants to meet her spiritual needs, talking to her of that wonderful water that shall be unto him a water springing up into everlasting life. Now, we know that he was talking to the Spirit because we have John chapter 7. She didn't have chapter 7, she's in chapter 4. So instead of understanding this to be the spirit, she took another interpretation of the Greek word, which is running water instead of living. And she thought he was offering to build an aqueduct and pipe the water to her house. And she said, yeah, meet my natural needs. Now we're talking something worthwhile. 
He wants to meet spiritual needs. She wants natural needs met. But don't condemn her too seriously. When the presence of the Lord is flowing, don't we normally bring up headaches, ingrown toenails, and financial problems? He has come to meet spiritual needs, and we want free doctor service instead. In verse 16, Jesus discusses her marriage. And in verse 19, she discusses his prophetic office. No matter what Jesus said, she countered it, confused the issue, or totally rejected it. And so do we. Do you note with me that Jesus never condemned her, nor argued with her? He just propounded another issue. Why? Well, I am told, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I am told that when Jesus said in verse 18, in that saidest thou truly, the thrust of the Greek is, finally, you've told the truth. I think all the Lord was after was a truthful statement from her lips. Finally, you've told the truth. You see, God cannot deal with us until we come to the truth. As long as we're dealing in hypocrisy, deceit, or double dealing, God cannot deal with us because he by nature is truth and can only flow in the areas of truth. And so he kept changing the subject. And when he got a lie, he changed the subject. And when he got a hypocrisy, he changed the subject. When he got deceit, he changed the subject. But when he got truth, well, it wasn't too much truth. It was one-sixth of the truth. But that was a thousand times more truth than he'd had up to this point. And he moved in on it. She said, I have no husband. She had had five and was uh, in the process of the sixth. The Lord said, that's enough truth. You'd be amazed how little truth God needs to move in on your life. You might be even more amazed how little truth he gets. And he began to move in on this woman on the small measure of truth that she'd given, one-sixth of a truth. And I want you to notice this moving in. He neither condemns nor condones her moral behavior. The issue is not to settle whether it's right to divorce and remarry or not. The issue is not to deal with her apparent promiscuity. The Lord was trying to help this woman find the truth about herself so she could find the truth about him. Well, I want to take a parenthesis to tell you I know that throughout the scriptures, wherever the coming of the Holy Spirit is spoken of, the very next subject is interpersonal relationships, usually marriage. Keep being filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, submitting yourselves one to another. Wives, submit yourself unto your husbands. Husbands, love your wives four times over. All the way through the New Testament, this is the next subject. And I would that I had time to speak of this because I'm afraid that in too many of our spirit-filled circles, we're not allowing the presence of the Spirit to heal our marriages, and God intended that it should. And I'm convinced that my worship, the very seat of my relationship to God, cannot ascend much higher than my relationship with my fellow man, and especially the relationship of my marriage. God tied them together in his word. I don't think we have a right to untie them. But I don't believe that's the thrust of what Jesus is talking about here. I think that what the Lord was telling this little lady is, Honey, you're trying to scratch in your soul an itch that is in your spirit, and you'll never succeed. Your spirit is screaming, I want God, and you think it's your soul saying, I want a man. And you've been through five men and you're trying on the sixth one and it still isn't meeting any spirit needs in you. You see, God has yet to create the man that can meet a woman's spirit needs. And fellas, would you learn the lesson without being hurt deeply by experience that the woman has not been born who can meet your needs spiritually? The spirit belongs to God. It came from him, it belongs to him, and he never gave it to your marriage partner. That's his. And when we try to find our spirit needs met in the marriage bed, or on vacation treks, 
or in any other form of relationship, we're doomed to disaster because there's no way bringing our marriage to a high, fruitful relationship can meet our spirit needs. Only God can meet our spirit needs. And when our spirit is craving and longing and crying for God, nothing but nothing in life can satisfy that craving. Look with me at a few men in the scriptures who as men of this generation misinterpreted the cry of their spirit after God. There's Jacob, Genesis 22. Remember this supplanter, trickster, motivator, manipulator, managed to get the birthright away from his brother and then the blessing away from him and stir up such anger he had to flee for his life. But again, he couldn't face reality that he was running for his life, so he picked up the pretense, I'm going to go back to Haran to get myself a good wife. And in route back, first night out, God appeared to him, Genesis 22, 22. That beautiful vision of the ladder extending from earth to heaven with angels ascending and descending upon it. And having seen this, God spoke to this man and talked to him of relationship availability and that he was in fact his God and that he would indeed bring him back to his land. But in this 22nd verse, the moment Jacob awakened from this visitation, he said, Oh God, if you prosper me and make me be great and rich, I'll cut you in for 10% commission. And Jacob substituted materialism for relationship. When he got down to Haran, he scratched that itch again and again. Interestingly enough, his father-in-law changed his wages seven times. And old Jacob was able to manipulate and twist things to where he came out on top seven times. And he got materialism. He became a wealthy man. Back in the early 40s, I got my hands on a track that calculated the wealth of the gifts that Jacob sent to his brother Esau. For remember when he started home, he got down close to the brook and he heard that his brother was coming after him with an army. So he began to divide his goods in half. He's going to hold half back for himself and half for his brother. And he sent them over in herds and groups. And this man had calculated, but by, by the valuation of the early 40s, over $6 million worth of sheep, camels, cattle were sent to his brother. That's just half of what he's worth. That man really made it. He was screaming for something, and he thought it was materialism. When God had cut him down in half, the angel of the Lord wrestled with him. You know the story. God wrestled him down until finally the strength was broken. God changed him in his body so that he was crippled the rest of his life, changed him in his behavior, and changed him in his nature, and changed him in his name. And his name was changed from Jacob the supplanter or trickster to Israel, the God ruled man. And then he came to rest in peace. From that moment on, we never hear of him as a supplanter, a trickster, a manipulator, or even attempting to amass things. All that matters is that he had touched God. You see, he, as many of our generation, was trained to satiate the craving of a spirit after God with things. And it won't happen. How many do we know? Or perhaps we've experienced it in our own lives. Trying desperately to satisfy an inner longing with things. We move from one size house to another. From one brand of car to another. From one size boat to another. From one job to another. Always convinced if we could just get a little higher on this rung of the ladder of success... We'll be satisfied, but when we get there, we find as deep a longing and dissatisfaction as we'd had on the prior run. And if you've ever made it to the top, you've met the most lonely people in America. If there's no place else to go, and this isn't it, then life has been a waste. No, no, materialism can never satisfy that inner longing and craving after God. 
Moses gives us an example of it in Exodus 2, verse 12. I'm convinced that Moses had an awareness of a confrontation with God and a calling from God. Perhaps it came vicariously through his mother, but he lived with that sense, I'm called to be a deliverer. But he discovered what you and I have finally learned, God's time schedule doesn't necessarily match our ambitions. And so Moses, to satisfy this craving, decided to step out and get involved in social action. He was going to be the deliverer. If he had to kill off the Egyptians one at a time, he was going to deliver his people. Of course, it didn't work. He had to flee for his life, put in 40 years, herding his father and lost sheep on the backside of a desert, and then confrontation with God. Then the voice from God, then an entering into reality, and only then could God let him be a real deliverer. Not now as social action, but as a spiritual ministry. And yet we have many people who feel the answer to their deep longings is social action. I'll get my degree in this or that or the other and I will get involved. Oh, we're going to set these people free or we're going to do this and we're going to get better housing. We're going to give this. Wait a minute. You'll never satisfy the real craving in your spirit. Your spirit is saying, I want God. Somewhere along the line, you've been confronted by Jesus and your spirit can never be satisfied with anything but him from that day on. Israel substituted service and tried her best to find satisfaction in doing after the Lord appeared to them and it never satisfied them. And the church's first answer to a deep longing for God is service. The moment a person gets saved, we want them to have a job. Job for every man and every man in his job. You know, give him something important to do like third assistant to the flower committee, but make him know he's wanted. Wait a minute, don't give them a job. Teach them how to worship. The crying in their spirit is to worship the Lord. Out of worship, they'll work themselves silly for him, his sake. But let's teach one another that the craving in our spirit is for God. And only God can satisfy that longing and that craving. Aaron tried to satisfy and satiate the deep longing of the people with idolatry. And what a mess he made of it. No golden calf can ever satisfy that longing for God. Nothing short of God, no matter how enthusiastically or fervently you would worship it, nor how expensive it may have been to produce it, nothing can satisfy the longing in your spirit but God himself, because the spirit came from God. He breathed that spirit into man, and he became a living soul. And only God can touch the vibrant chords of that spirit and make them come alive. No idolatry can do it. James and John in Matthew 10 felt that that deep long that had been stirred in them from being with the Son of God on a protracted season could be satisfied if they could just have position and authority. They even got Mama to come and help and plead with Jesus that their sons could sit one on the right hand and one on the left. They wouldn't ask for anything else if they could just be the big shots. And I still find people, even in the religious world, who feel that if they can just have position and authority, that would be it. That will satisfy them. And I still get letters every once in a while from somebody who starts the first paragraph, Dear Brother Corner, you do not know me. Let me introduce myself to you. I am the apostle of, I am the prophet of, I am the something of. And I find it very difficult to read any further. Because I feel sorry for the deep, seated longing to be satisfied in position and authority and I'm also scared to get too deeply involved I've seen how dangerous these people can be I'm sure that God has apostles and prophets I'm not the least bit concerned about that but those I've met that seem to have that level ministry are the last to talk about it they don't run around wearing their signs apostle prophet evangelist APE they just do the job and flow in the work of the Lord I've seen church politics that were destructive as people fight to become a board member or fuss over being the pianist, you know, fighting to be the pastor's right-hand man. Not be satisfied. Because the drive, the yearning, the burning, that unsatiated, unsatisfied craving 
is not for position or authority. It's for God. Or you look in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 19. Here's Simon the sorcerer, as called in the scripture, a magician, a man who had worked perhaps with demon powers, saved, apparently soundly so. And then he's watched the disciples lay hands upon the people and commit to them the Holy Spirit and the people break forth in other tongues. He says, that's for me. Woo, if I just had that kind of power. If I could just lay my, my, my hands on them and they'd break forth. And he came to the disciples with a bag of money and tried to buy that power. How many of you have done any reading in J.B. Phillips' translation of the New Testament? I know it's been out a long time, but it's the New Testament translation that really made me face myself. I've read the King James or the Authorized Brethren so often that it was getting to be um, kind of a sing-song to me. When I started reading from J.B. Phillips' translation, it just sucked me right between the eyes. Do you know how he translates Peter's reply to Simon the Sorcerer? Phillips translates it, to hell with you and your money. And I find it easy to believe Peter would speak in those terms. <laughs> Power. Woo! If everybody would just fall down when I pray for them. Woo -hoo, glory. If I could just open all the blind eyes. I want to empty the hospital beds. I want to have power. Oh, Lord, send the power. Hurry up, do it now. Oh, Lord, send the power. We have news for you. It won't satisfy you. Few men who have come into high-level power have survived long. Mighty hard to handle. The craving is not for power. The craving is for divine presence. And I believe here this little woman at the well, the Lord bringing up her marriage is not to condemn her or to show her how terrible she is. I rather suppose she knew that. The longer I live, the greater my awareness that God has not sent us to preach sin. Because I had yet to meet a sinner who was unaware that he was a sinner. I meet a lot of religious people who are not aware of it, but I've not met a sinner who's unaware of it. He's just unwilling to admit it until you can convince him there's a way out of it. I think this woman knew. She had been told by everyone in the community what a no-no she was. She didn't need one more person to say, you're a worthless, no good woman. No, the Lord didn't bring it up. To remind her what she had done, the Lord brought it up to help her find out why she had done. For you see with the Lord, whys are far more important than what. Motivation is far more important to God than manifestation. It's out of the abundance of the heart. And so the Lord goes to the heart's abundance. And I think he was simply telling this little lady, dear, do you realize why you're so unsuccessful in marriage? It isn't that you've chosen five bad men in a row. It's just that you are trying to find something in a man that can't be found there. Satisfaction for your spirit. You have a spirit that's crying after God. And interestingly enough, in the next five verses, worship is mentioned nine times. You can't find another passage in the New Testament where worship is mentioned that consistently and consecutively in five verses. Worship, 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 worship. What is he saying this to this worthless, no good woman? He's telling this woman, honey, there's a craving in your spirit that you have misinterpreted. You don't understand that God has approached you and that your spirit wants him. Have you ever had an itch that the moment you scratched it, it moved? Sure we have. It's terrible threatening not to find the real itchy place. You don't quite know where to scratch. I think that was this woman's problem. She had an itch and she kept trying to find where to scratch. And no matter where she scratched, it was wrong. Some years back, when I was pastoring a church in the west coast of Oregon, we were in a building program, and we men of the church were building it with our own hands, and we got to a point of exhaustion and took off a few days to rest. And the first night off, my wife fixed me my favorite meal, and of course I overate. Went in the front room afterwards, propped myself up in my recliner chair, and I was going to relax. I'd been deeply involved in that building program for over a year. I didn't know how to relax. And I laid there tense, 
and then became aware, as I got quiet, of a deep longing, a hunger. And I tried to analyze it. Well, you know, I haven't had time to listen to any music, and I used to be a musician, and, you know, a musician can only stay away from music about so long. So I got out of my chair and put some classical music on the stereo and sat back to listen and enjoy. But it irritated me. I wasn't in the mood for the classics. So I pulled that tape off and I put on some gospel music and sat back and that didn't satisfy me at all. No form of music satisfied me. Well, that settles that. It's certainly not my emotions. Well, perhaps it's my intellect. I haven't had any time to read for months and I used to live in books. So I reached up and pulled down Spurgeon, and usually I can really get excited with him, but uh, somehow I couldn't get with him. I put him back and pulled down Finney, and this evening I couldn't even understand what he was saying. Put him back, tried G. Campbell Morgan, one of my favorite authors, and I, I just couldn't get with him either. I put it back on the shelf, but well, maybe I should do some light reading. And at that time I was very caught up with flying a private pilot so I picked up a flying magazine and surely I'd find something in here that interested me and it didn't there was still that hunger so I flipped it down so well I guess I'm hungry I went into the kitchen and fixed myself a big sandwich <laughs> came back and took a bite and found that while I could chew there was no room to swallow <laughs> and in disgust I put it over on the stand and I said now think Cornwall think it can't be your body, it's already overfed. <laughs> it's not your intellect, you've tried a variety of reading. This hunger isn't in your emotions, you've tried a variety of music. What does that leave? Only your spirit. Oh, of course, I haven't prayed for several days. Got out of the chair, got on my knees and began to seek God. And when I touched him, total satisfaction through my whole being, total satisfaction. So that when I got up, it didn't matter what music I put on, it was enjoyable. Nor did it matter what I read, it was interesting. You see, I, Mr. Cornwall, pastor of the church, had misread the cry of my spirit and interpreted it as a cry of my body or a cry of my intellect or a cry of my emotions. It's easy to do. I think that's why Paul puts in juxtaposition as in Ephesians 5, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Having been raised in an heritage that taught us, the Bible teaches total abstinence, whether it does or not, doesn't matter, the church taught it and I believed it. I found it awfully hard to accept the statement being soused with being Spirit-filled all in one verse. I felt Paul had made a terrible mistake by making that contrast until I realized by the Spirit but what Paul was saying is that the same thing that drives one man to drink drives another man to God. Both have spirits that are crying out, I want God! One man misinterprets it and thinks that it's in his appetite passion and goes to drink. Another man rightly interprets it and says it's my spirit and reaches up to keep being filled with the spirit. And I would challenge you, dear ones, I care not how long you've been, quote, in the way, close quote, how long you've been filled with the Spirit? I challenge you to learn the difference between the craving of your spirit after God and the craving of your emotions, your intellect, or your body after satisfaction. We need to learn the cry of our spirit. And until it has been satisfied, yea, more than satisfied, satiated in God, the rest of you is going to be miserable all your days. Although I know better, I'm not always ruled by what I know. There are times when I face such a heavy schedule, deadlines. The worst of it is when I'm home, because usually I'm out two months and home two days. And when I go home, I have two months of mail waiting for me. And I face a heavy schedule. Frequently, oh, too frequently, God forgive me. I decide that I don't really have time to pray today. You know, I can't spend two hours on my knees. So I give God a quick salute as I walk through the door and go to work. Oh, you're ahead of the story. It is one miserable day. Used to be my secretary when I had one would finally buzz me on the intercom and say, Pastor, 
You haven't touched God in prayer today, have you? How do you know? Oh, the atmosphere is charged with the wrong attitudes. Now it's my wife who gently knocks on the door because the office is now in the house and says, Honey, uh, wouldn't it be worthwhile if you just take you know, just an hour out and, and just relax in the presence of the Lord? Because my whole day goes wrong. Nothing is right when my spirit says, Hey, I've been cheated. But if I allow my spirit to touch God in worship fairly early in the day, then it's so satisfied, it's willing to go along with the activity of the mind and the emotions and the body because it has touched God and can keep that communion going. Saints, we can't survive long without communion with God. And if we continuously misread that call, then we're going to try to satiate it in areas of our emotion, intellect, or body, and that's the problem of this little woman. She thought that in the interpersonal involvement of marriage, in the sexual encounter perhaps, she could find satisfaction for this craving, but it wasn't there, nor will it be for you or me. That spirit can only be satisfied in God. If you will remember the message Saturday evening, I suggested that God, like a giant magnet, is approaching us. Remember how I spoke of the plane of the magnet with the metal filings and how the magnetism seems to pass through the invisible layer of the air and begin to affect and stir and excite and animate and almost translate into living beings, these little pieces of metal, until they start reaching up to touch the magnet? Somehow I feel that's what God is doing today. And I feel that some who have been able to be satisfied with religious duties and doings and with a good life are terribly dissatisfied with it now. And I'm afraid there's unnecessary misinterpretation of it. I think some are divorcing needlessly. They just need to interpret the dissatisfaction as being in their spirit level, not on their marriage level. I see men quitting good jobs just because of dissatisfaction. I see other men quitting the ministry, men quitting jobs to go into the ministry, men quitting the ministry to go into jobs, when really the craving is after God. Oh, I couldn't tell you how many dollars I've spent calling long distance or catching a plane to go to the side of one of the recently filled charismatic pastors when the word gets to me that he has asked his church for sabbatical leave to go back to seminary to get a little higher degree I do everything in my power to talk them out of it. Now, I'm not anti-education, and all of us wish I had more. But you'll never find anything in a seminary that can satisfy the longing after God. And my thinking is, if this man has made it fine for these 20 years or 25 years of his ministry, and now is filled with the Spirit, he's only misinterpreting his craving. He thinks it's his intellect wanting to know more when it's his Spirit wanting to relate more. And I'm simply trying to inform them, and man, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. If you think through your brain, you can satisfy your spirit. You've had a new contact with God. You've been awakened to something new. Instead of taking a year off to go back to school, why don't you take two hours off every morning to go to the presence of God? And for those who have been willing to hear me, they've come into great satisfaction and depth of flow in God. How about us? Haven't we substituted everything I've suggested and many things more? to try to satisfy that pulling, that churning, that yearning, that magnetism of God pulling upon our spirit. All he's trying to do is bring us from the table where we fellowship one another to the golden altar where we, with one another, will fellowship God. But it is disconcerting. We don't understand it. We don't interpret it as being a call of the spirit. And so it produces conflict in our lives. Please don't run from conflict. Learn from conflict. Inner turmoil is ordained of God. It's part of his process of helping you learn what's not right. You know, when David had to be trained to be king, he was a very good specialist in leading sheep, but God needed the fellow to lead men. God put him in the house of the man he had just rejected and taught David by a bad example, simply saying, David, that's the way not to do it learning. That's the way not to do it. 
David learned how to do by seeing how not to do. And I believe many of the conflicts that come into our life are teaching aids of God, saying that's the way not to do it. Like I found out it wasn't music I wanted, it wasn't literature I wanted, it wasn't food I wanted. Finally, when I eliminated it down, all that was left was God. Saints, if there's inner turmoil and conflict, take another look at it. It may not be the devil. It may be God. It may not be that brute of a man you live with called husband or that miserable woman you chose as a wife. It may be God. It may be the spirit in you wanting something that cannot be satisfied in anything but God. Cannot we cry out then with the psalmist, O oh soul, bless thou the Lord. I will bless the Lord with my whole heart. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. If that is your response, God puts a mark on your forehead and says, there's a potential of a worshiper there. There's a potential of a worshiper. They recognize it's the Spirit crying after God. The first reaction to confrontation is conflict. But out of that conflict, you're going to learn what it is that God is doing. The second reaction we'll see tomorrow night is glorious, marvelous confusion. <laughs> Would you stand with me and let's lift our spirits toward God? You on the radio, you lift your hearts and praise with us because God is calling to your spirit right now. Hallelujah, we will praise you, Lord. We will glorify.